four years. So with that, we're very happy to uh, answer any questions you have. Yes? You spoke about the no match, no vote issue, and I want to be clear that that applies only to newly registered voters. Yes. Any cases that you know of where there's an attempt to apply no match, no vote limitations to already registered voters? Wendy? In fact, the effort in Wisconsin is directed not only to newly registered voters, but to anybody who registered since January 1, 2006. Is that the only one? Um, you know, there are purge efforts that are underway, and we're in the process of investigating them that are using processes similar to no match, no vote, where, they're, um, where the voter rolls are being compared to other databases, including the same databases here. There, there's efforts, for example, in Georgia to, um, if people don't match, um, uh, if people's um, citizenship records didn't match in their driver's licenses. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of um, states this year for the first time that are matching data across state lines. Um, and that could lead um, in, in some jurisdictions to removing people that they believe have moved with the same kinds of error prone assumptions and processes. Yes. Um, on, on the no match, no vote situation in Ohio, can you give us an update on the attempt to block that? And if it fails, is it a given that the 200,000 people that you mentioned that have typos in their voter registrations won't be allowed to vote? Uh, it is not a given. Uh, that is now moved to the state court as opposed to federal court. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the outcome is going to be there. But the time has passed and the deadline has passed for whole scale a uh, whole-scale removal of those people. What would likely be the case is if, if the state court allowed it, uh, that you would see challenges uh, on an individual basis at the polling places. And um, even if the state court action fails, there is still a risk to those 200,000 voters um, of individual challenges at the polling places. Their names are still flagged on the voter rolls. And so we still need to be vigilant to make sure that nobody is denied their vote or, or actually made to go through an onerous process just because of these typos. Yes? Um, what do you think, if you have an opinion, will happen in November? Do the pluses outweigh the minuses? Do you think it will be a close election? Well, of course, we don't know about the, the votes. But uh, we are very clear on this. Based on our work over years on this, the level of attempted disenfranchisement in this election is substantially greater than we've ever seen in previous recent federal elections. Uh, you are seeing it in a way that is uh, fierce and would have a significant impact, and it's popping up right before the election. And it is uh, so uh, if we don't blow the whistle and call attention and push back, it could have a significant impact. Um, however, uh, we're hopeful that on election day, that uh, in the end, everybody's vote will count or that it will come close. We, you know, we, these kinds of voting issues can have a very significant impact, especially if elections are close. And it's not just a national election, but elections within the states. We all saw how that had an impact on Florida in 2000. If people don't remember, Florida was not the closest state in 2000. New Mexico was even closer. So these things can make a difference. There have been a lot of accusations against the Republicans for, for this sort of thing. Have you seen any instances where the other side is doing the same thing? Well, one of the things I mentioned, uh, for example, uh, was uh, Secretary of State Jennifer Broomer. We, we, uh, we are seeing, we are nonpartisan, and we've worked on this issue in a variety of ways. And when we see this kind of stuff come up, we bring it out to light and we draw, leave it to others to draw conclusions about who's doing it. These three issues, purges and no match, no vote, and challenges simply have played out in this way. A number of other voting issues, uh, such as the uh, readiness and the electronic voting, uh, have really not even been partisan battlegrounds. And really, we don't think that voting ought to be a partisan battleground, and it ought, it ought not be anybody's political strategy to try to keep other people from voting. Yes? Michael, you said that 20% of provisional ballots in the March primary in Ohio were rejected. Why were they rejected? And more importantly, did that 
my colleagues. And I should introduce uh, the mystery guest here is Jonah Goldman from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, a colleague uh, nonpartisan organization which is coordinating the voter hotline. So if you have questions about the election day voter hotline, Jonah can answer those. There, there are a lot of reasons why provisional ballots don't count. The reported, the, the most um, common reason that they don't count is because people aren't on the voter rolls, and they don't explain why, but some of these kinds of problems that we've um, talked about, like purges, no match, no vote, um, technical barriers to voter registration, um, are, are some of the reasons why this happens. Another significant reason that provisional ballots don't get counted is because people are um, uh, show up in the wrong polling place or they get misdirected by election officials officials to the wrong polling place. And so those are, and so the, and their entire ballot gets invalidated in, in many states and in most of them and not just the races that they were not eligible to vote for. Do you believe that affected any of the races in the primary? Yeah, I, I, we, I'm, I'm not sure. We don't know. When it comes to, uh, oh, when yes. it comes to, um, to the matching um, as, what, as happened in, in Louisiana, um, what do you say to people who might say, who might look at that situation and say, well, if you moved out of Louisiana, uh, understandably it's because of the hurricane, but if you've moved away, then you shouldn't be allowed to vote in Louisiana. Um, that's why they removed them. And what do you say? It, it does not seem reasonable? Or? Yeah. If you've moved out of a, a, an election jurisdiction, and um, you know the federal law and actually state law has protections for people who move, and a, a number of them, many of them, can still vote in their old precincts. But if they are among the people that can't, that doesn't necessarily mean that a purge on a, based on suspected movers is either lawful or actually appropriate, because as it turns out, these um, purge attempts or these match attempts are really error prone. So the mere fact that two people have the same name um, in two different states um, does not necessarily mean that they're the same person who moved. Um, this actually happened um, across state lines between Kentucky and um, Tennessee and South Carolina in 2006, and a federal, uh, a state court looked into it, found that the name, the list contained a, a number, many people who just had the same name who lived in two different neighboring states, and found that it was actually unlawful under Kentucky law, and so they had to reinstate 8,000 voters. So that's more likely the case. Yes. Explain what your areas of concern would be moving forward if we end up in a recount situation. How would hmm. you approach that? And what are your top areas of concern? Uh, we have fortunately not had to work on recounts very much lately. Um, and uh, we, uh, we've barely begun to turn toward that. And, I, I, you know, we, 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 there are other groups who, who work on that more. And maybe, uh, Larry, well, have you? I, I can see there are, there are a couple of concerns that I have. Um, one is obviously if you have a, a, an electronic voting system that's paperless, it's pretty difficult to do uh, a recount. And, and for instance, in Virginia, uh, as far as I know, the, the current law is for, for counties that have uh, touchscreen machines that what they do for the recount is they just they go back to the envelope that contains the total tape from, that was printed out and they look at it. Uh, and, and if they can't read it, they print it out again, and it says exactly the same thing. So there's really not an opportunity to do a recount. Um, so if there, if there were any problems with the machine, uh, there, there wouldn't be any way of, of, of really having evidence of that uh, in terms of counting. Uh, it's a second thing that I'm concerned about uh, is general, uh, and, and we talk about this in the report that we released last week, what are called, what's called ballot accounting and reconciliation. There were a number of instances uh, in the primaries uh, over the past couple of months where uh, votes were lost, they were dropped uh, when they went from the precinct to the county, and making sure that all of those processes um, were thorough would be something that I, I, I would want to look at uh, in a recount to make sure that all votes were accounted for.